Unless I am convicted by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. Those were the famous words of the Protestant reformer Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms on April 18th, 1521. Six months earlier, Luther had nailed his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg. And what started as a theological debate in a small town in Germany was beginning to spread all across Europe into what we now call the Protestant Reformation. Luther's writings were fanning the flames of Reformation across Europe and The Roman Catholic Church was not very happy about it, to say the least. Luther was charged with heresy and brought on trial before the political and religious rulers of Germany at a diet, or what we might call today a hearing, in the city of Worms. The Roman Catholic Church demanded that Luther recant his views or else suffer a heretic's death and be burned at the stake. Now, the Roman Catholic Church opposed many of Luther's teachings, but there was one in particular that was especially repulsive to them, one that they absolutely could not tolerate, and to this day still do not tolerate. The one doctrine above all the rest that they rejected was the very one laid out right here in our text in Romans chapter 3. The doctrine of justification by faith alone. The doctrine that we are not justified, or to say it another way, we are not declared righteous in God's sight by our works, nor by our faith plus our works, but rather by our faith alone. It is by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, that we are justified that we are saved. But justification by faith alone is not just some doctrine for theologians with more college degrees than Fahrenheit to argue over. It is foundational for our faith, and it gets right at the very heart of our relationship with God. It shapes everything about our lives, even how we interact with others. And justification by faith alone is not just what Martin Luther and the Protestant reformers taught. It's not even just what the Apostle Paul taught, but as we will see, the whole Bible teaches this doctrine that we are not saved by our works, but by faith alone. Look at me beginning in verses 19 and 20. In verses 19 and 20, Paul summarizes the entire argument he's been making in the first two and a half chapters of this letter to the church in Rome. Verse 19. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Now, right before this, Paul has just quoted a whole bunch of different verses, mostly from the Psalms, but also from the Proverbs and one from the prophets. These verses are all part of the law or the Old Testament, and they all speak of the universal sinfulness of humanity. They say things like, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. The problem is when the Jews read those verses, they tend to think that God was talking about their enemies, about all the non-Jews, about whom they called the Gentiles. And the Jews read their Old Testaments and thought, Well, well, thank goodness we're not like those people. Can you believe that those people are so sinful? Now, the thing is, some of those words were actually spoken to God's enemies. But the shocking truth that Paul points out here in verse 19 is that whatever the Old Testament says, it's speaking first and foremost to those who are under the law. In other words, to those who are the keepers of the law. 
So when the Old Testament says that none is righteous, that no one does good, it's not talking first and foremost about those Gentiles. It's talking first and foremost about the Jews. And if we're not careful, we have a tendency to read the Bible in the same way, don't we? The danger is we can read the Bible and it's tough talk for sinners and sinful behavior and think to ourselves, well, thank goodness we're not like those people. That same sort of I'm better than you attitude crops up whenever we hear a sermon and instead of immediately first applying it to ourselves, we think, I sure hope my spouse is listening right now. Or, man, I wish my lost neighbors were here and could hear this. But Paul says that whatever God's word says, it's not speaking first and foremost to those people out there, but to these people in here, to the people who sit under the teaching and authority of God's word. So we shouldn't hear the words, all have sinned, and think that somehow we're an exception standing on morally higher ground than everybody else in the rest of the world. What Paul is saying here in verse 19 is really significant because nobody thought the Gentiles were righteous. Not even the Gentiles thought they were righteous. They didn't think they were righteous according to God's law because most of them didn't even know God's law. They didn't know the Ten Commandments even existed. But as Paul points out in chapter 1, it doesn't matter if the Gentiles know God's law or not because they know enough about God through creation that they know that they ought to seek and serve and love and obey him, but they don't. And so they are condemned. All the Gentiles, all the non-ethnic Jews like you and me are guilty sinners who deserve God's judgment. But unlike the Gentiles, the Jews were the keepers of the law. And so what Paul says here is they really ought to know better. The Jews don't have a spiritual advantage. If anything, they deserve greater condemnation because they know God's law and have disobeyed it. They know better than the Gentiles who God is and what God demands of them. And yet they have all sinned against God. Not one of them is righteous either. So when God's law says no one is righteous, no, not one, it's not just talking about those idolatrous Gentiles. It's talking about everyone. Paul says in verse 19 that the reason the law speaks this way is so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. When the law speaks, the world is silent. The picture is of the cosmic courtroom on judgment day when every single person Jew and non-Jew, Christian and non-Christian, religious and non-religious, stand before God the judge and the charges against us will be read. Each individual will be charged with their sin over and over and over and over again. Every sinful thought, every sinful action, every sinful word, every sinful desire. It will all be exposed and charged against us. And when all our sins are laid out and charged against us, no one will even dare to make an excuse. No one will even try to make a defense. Every mouth will be shut and the whole world will be found guilty as charged. Verse 20, for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. When we stand before the judge of the universe and every sin we've ever committed is exposed and charged against us, nobody's going to say, yeah, yeah, but, but I read my Bible. Yeah, I, I did some bad things, but, but I got baptized. I went to church. Do you see how pathetic our good works seem compared to all our sins? But God doesn't just call our good works pathetic. In Isaiah, he calls them filthy rags, used toilet paper, 
The good things that we try to do to justify ourselves before God are disgusting in his sight. So Paul says, no one will be declared not guilty in God's sight by their good works. There is no justification through works. And if there's no justification through works, then there is no salvation through works. The law is not the means of our justification. The law is the means of our condemnation. Verse 20, since through the law comes knowledge of sin, Paul says that no one will be justified by works of the law because that's not even the point of the law to begin with. The law does not exist to save us. The law exists to show us we need to be saved. Listen, if you can read the 10 commandments and come away thinking, I'm not that bad, then you need to read them again because God the Spirit works through the law to convict us of our sin and to humble us. When the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of our hearts to see just how sinful we really are and that we can't do enough good to be acceptable in God's sight, then it will change us forever. It will even change how we interact with others. Because when you've been so humbled by the law that your face is in the dirt, it's really hard to look down your nose on others. This is one reason why this, just, this doctrine of justification by faith alone is so necessary for us as witnesses of Jesus Christ. Yes, it is necessary because it's the core of the gospel message that we share with others, but it's also necessary because it humbles us. I, I don't know if you've realized it yet or not, but it's really hard to be motivated to share the gospel with the lost when you think I'm better than them. I honestly think that this is one of the biggest reasons why we don't share the gospel today like we ought to. I know it's been a personal struggle for me. We don't share the gospel with those kind of people because we don't think that they'll actually believe it. Or we don't share the gospel with those kind of people because we don't think they deserve it. We don't invite our gay neighbor or our Muslim classmate to church because you know, they just don't seem like the type. Like somehow, we before we got saved, we weren't just as lost as they are now. Like somehow, we were the type of people God saves, but not those people. But then, with that attitude, even if we do share the gospel with those people, our spiritual arrogance makes the gospel unattractive to them. Lost people are not stupid. They know when they're being talked down to. But what a difference it would make if we really believe that we are not justified by our works. What a difference it would make if we believe that there is nothing in us that made us more acceptable to God than those people. That we are sinners who deserve God's judgment just like those people. That Apart from God's grace, we're going to hell with everyone else. Then we wouldn't look down our nose when we share the gospel with the drug addict or the drag queen. We would come to them humbly as equals, as sinners condemned under God's law equally, but with the most amazing news in the world to share with them. You see, when you know you are a sinner just like everyone else, It humbles you and it changes how you treat others. Justification by faith alone severs the root of spiritual pride. It's impossible to have an I'm better than you attitude when you truly recognize that you're just as equally deserving of God's judgment as everybody else. And Paul says that it is through the law that we come to recognize that. So, That means that the law is not all that bad. Think about it. It's actually a gift of God's grace. It's grace that God gives us the law so that the power of the Holy Spirit, we realize that we are guilty sinners in need of a savior. It's far better to know that you are a sinner and to cry out, what must I do to be saved than to not even know it? Ignorance is bliss until you die and go to hell forever. 
So it is by God's grace that God gives us his law to reveal us, to us our sinfulness and our need for our Savior. As Martin Luther says, the law is meant to drive us to Christ. When the law is properly used, its value cannot be too highly appraised. It will take me to Christ every time. And that is exactly where the Apostle Paul takes us next. Look with me at verse 21. This verse begins what some theologians call the most important paragraph in the entire Bible. Here in this paragraph, Paul makes a new point in his argument. Paul has already proven that we are all sinners. He has already proven that no one will be justified by works of the law. Or in other words, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by their good works. Now Paul gets to the good news. The good news of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. The righteousness of God is what we're after. It's what we need to be justified. We need it to be saved. A lot of people, even a lot of very religious people, think that God has a scale and that if we can get our good to outweigh our bad, that we will get into heaven. But the apostle Paul has already made it clear that's not gonna work because that's not how God's scale works. Here's how God's scale works. God takes all of his righteousness, all of his goodness, and he dumps it on one side of the scale. And he says, your goodness must equal my goodness or you're not getting in. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said things like, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, that of the most religious people on earth, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. But we already know that according to the law, none of us are perfect. And that by means of the law, we will never be able to do enough good works to equal God's righteousness. But, Paul says, there is a way apart from the law. But there's only one way. Verse 21. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the law and the prophets is another way of referring to the whole Old Testament. That means this way is not just taught in the book of Romans by the Apostle Paul. That means that it's taught in the whole Bible. Just as the law bears witness to our unrighteousness under the law, so it also bears witness to the righteousness that may be ours apart from the law. Verse 22, this is that way. The way to righteousness apart from the law is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. The only way to be declared righteous, to be justified, to be saved is through faith in Jesus Christ. And what is faith? Martin Luther says, faith is a living, unshakable confidence in God's grace. Faith is trusting and believing that Jesus Christ alone is our Savior and Lord. We do not trust in our works, but by faith we trust in His works, His perfectly righteous life, His substitutionary death on the cross. And just as all are condemned under the law, so all will be justified apart from the law by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says this righteousness is for all who believe, Jews and Gentiles, religious and non-religious. All who believe in Jesus will be justified. And when Paul says everybody, notice, he means everybody. <laughs> he keeps saying this word over and over, for all who believe, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have all failed to live for God's glory and to give God the glory that he alone deserves. 
It's not that we just tried really, really, really hard to meet God's glorious standard and we just came up a little bit short. No, we're not even close. So all have sinned and all, verse 24, are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It is by grace that we are justified, by his grace as a gift. Some versions say here, we are justified freely by his grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. When we don't get what we deserve, we call that grace. God graciously grants us justification by faith in Jesus. We cannot earn our justification by our works, but we receive our justification freely as a gift by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. When we trust in Jesus, we receive the righteousness of God and all our sins are forgiven because Jesus lived a perfectly righteous life and paid the penalty of our, that our sins deserve on the cross. So that means when we are united by faith to Jesus, then God looks upon us as having the same righteousness as his son. The same righteousness as God the son, which is the same righteousness as God the father. So we are acceptable to God, not because we met God's standards, but because Christ met God's standards for us. And this changes everything. This is the foundation of our faith and the heart of our relationship with God and at the heart of our relationship with others, both inside and outside the church. We, we can't have an I'm better than you attitude when we know that under the law, we're sinners like everyone else in the world. And by faith, we're righteous like everyone else in the church. There's no such thing as justified and justifieder and justifiedest. In Christ, we are all equally justified. We are all equally declared righteous by God, by grace through faith. Now, I know that we would just never look at somebody at church and just outright say to them, you know, I think I'm better than you. We would probably never do that. But sometimes our actions speak louder than our words, don't they? Sometimes we might not invite others in the church over for dinner, or we might avoid getting to know them because we think they're just a little too different than us. We might not invite certain people to our Bible fellowship group because we think they're a little too weird, or they're a little too needy, or they just probably wouldn't be the right type. We might not invite them into a Bible study or into an equipped group because we think their lives are just a little too messed up and we can't handle that right now. We don't invite them because we have created our own standards of acceptability, or in other words, our own standard of righteousness. I know this has been a personal struggle for me. I'm guilty of this. But I hope we see how horribly inconsistent it is to look at a brother or sister in Christ and to say, even though I fail to meet God's standards and he accepts me, I will not accept you unless you meet my standards. That's nothing more than an I'm better than you attitude. But on the other side, some of you have been invited, but you won't join the church or a BFG or an equip group because you don't really think you need to. And if that's you, be careful. Because you might not even be aware of it, but what you actually might be saying in your heart is, I don't need accountability from the church. I don't need help applying God's word to my life at a BFG. I don't need more discipleship at an equipped group. You all might need that, but I don't need that. That also sounds an awful lot like an I'm better than you attitude, doesn't it? Now, I know there are all kinds of different circumstances and reasons why someone might not be able to be involved in those things right now. 
But I hope that one of those reasons is not just because you think you don't need to. If that's you, then check your heart. Because when you know that you are a sinner in desperate need of God's grace, I think you'll wanna get all the help you can to follow Jesus. There's only one solution to the I'm better than you attitude, and it's this. The doctrine of justification by faith alone. Spiritual pride withers and dies at Golgotha because the ground is hard and level at the foot of the cross. There is no moral high ground on which to stand at the cross. We're all equally condemned and we're all equally made righteous by grace through faith in Jesus. If we could be saved by our works or by a mixture of our faith plus our works, then we would have something to boast in. We could pat ourselves on the back because of all the good things we've done. We could brag about how much we've read our Bible or how much we've given to the church or how much we've served. But when those things cannot justify us and when a redemption must be paid, then our mouths are stopped and our boasting is silenced. We are humbled when we realize that we are great saviors. We are great sinners in need of a great savior, just like those people. You see, Paul says in verse 24 that we are freely justified by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Our justification is a gift. We do nothing to earn it. It's absolutely free. It costs us nothing. But it costs God everything. Think about it. What does that word redemption even mean? What does it mean to redeem someone? Well, it was a term used in the Apostle Paul's day to refer to the practice of paying a price to release someone from slavery or captivity. If you were sold into slavery or thrown into prison, then someone else could pay a redemption. They could pay a price to redeem you, to set you free, to buy you back. And usually it was not the most respectable kind of people that needed redemption. Usually it was slaves and criminals, the lowest of the low, those people. And when the Bible says that we were redeemed through Christ, that means we are those people, the lowest of the low, the people who cannot redeem themselves. So God pays the price to redeem us. And what was the price? It was none other than his one and only son, Jesus Christ. It was Jesus, the only one who was born under the law and lived in perfect obedience to the law. Jesus, the one to whom all the law and all the prophets bore witness. Jesus, the one who was put on trial before the religious and political rulers as a heretic. And when they demanded that he recant, his mouth was stopped. He was as silent as a sheep before its shears. Jesus, the one who was beaten and bruised and mocked and spat upon and finally crucified in our place on the cross. Jesus, the one who suffered the condemnation of the law he never broke. It was his blood that paid our ransom. It was his death that paid the price so that we can be forgiven and freely justified by God's grace. Our justification cost us nothing, but it cost Jesus everything. And he rose again on the third day so that by faith in him, now we can stand in God's sight in Christ as perfectly righteous. 
That means the only way to be declared righteous in God's sight and to be free from the penalty of sin is to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. The only way to be free of an I'm better than you attitude is to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Because when the Spirit opens our eyes to see all our sinfulness and grants us faith to trust in Christ alone for all our righteousness, then we will not boast in our works. Then we will not boast in ourselves. We will boast in Christ. We will boast in Jesus and what he has done. When we really understand that we are justified by faith alone, then we will not have an I'm better than you attitude, but we will have an Jesus is better than us attitude. And with a Jesus is better than us attitude, we'll be able to humbly go to those people and know that we, they're just like us under the law and humbly tell them about Jesus who redeems all of us by his blood. With a Jesus is better than us attitude, we'll be able to look at our brothers and sisters in Christ and humbly love and serve and graciously accept them just as God has graciously accepted us in Christ. We will boast in Christ together as a church until that day comes when we stand on trial before God the judge with all the world. And if he asks us, why should I let you into heaven? Our answer will be, here I stand in the righteousness of Christ alone. I cannot do otherwise. And then in the new heavens and new earth, when we gather together with all the redeemed, Mouths from every tribe and tongue and nation will not be stopped. They will be opened and we will loudly declare with all the redeemed that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we will loudly boast in Jesus, with Jesus forevermore.